uh, meaning that Pharaoh, he put them in ward, he gave them prison time, in the captain of the guard's house. So somehow the captain of the guard's home is also the prison. That's what I think. Or it could be that the territory of the captain of the guard, he has a home and a prison. So I think Dr. Uckman indicates that in his commentary, how there's a separate, uh, the house and then the prison is in uh, separate buildings. But who knows? And it is the place where Joseph was bound, verse 3. The place where Joseph was bound. That's where Joseph is locked up. Verse 4, and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. So the captain of the guard, he gave charge to Joseph over the chief of the butlers and the chief of the bakers. So Joseph was serving them. He's the one who would serve their meals. He's the one who would keep an eye on them, serve their time on, I guess, when to wash up, when they can go out, etc. So then the uh, butler and the baker, they continued about a season long in prison time. So it could be literally uh, three months, or it could mean uh, for a temporary time. Season could mean literally uh, three months, or it could be meaning metaphorically for a certain amount of time. An example is in the scriptures, there is pleasure in sin for a season. So obviously from that verse, that doesn't mean that you're, go you're guaranteeing to enjoy sin three months long. No, sometimes it can be longer than that. Or sometimes it could be way shorter than that. And I think from past experience, it's usually way shorter than that. Yeah, Verse 5, and they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night. So both of, both of them, the butler and the baker, dreamed a dream. So each man at that very same night dreamed a dream each man according to the interpretation of his dream. So each man, the butler and the baker, had their own, uh, realized there's some kind of meaning, some kind of interpretation behind the dream. So they're trying to figure it out. The butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the king, uh, which were, excuse me, of, of, I'm tired. <laughs> the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. So, uh, obviously, it's referring to the butler and the baker uh, who were locked up in prison. Verse 6, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. So, uh, meaning that Joseph just happened to check up on them at the morning time, and lo and behold, as he uh, looked at them, they were sad. Verse 7, And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, so Joseph, he asked Pharaoh's officers, that's referring to the butler and the baker, and they're with Joseph in the prison of uh, his Lord's house. So that could be referring to Pharaoh or it could be referring most likely to the captain of the guard, his home. So Joseph says these words when he asks them, wherefore look ye so sadly today? So why is it that today you're very sad. Verse 8, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So, uh, the butler and the baker, they say, We dreamed a dream, and we have nobody to interpret it. So remember, they're trying to figure out the interpretation. The previous verse mentioned that. They realize there's an interpretation behind it. Now, I know a lot of times most, uh, most of us uh, wouldn't bother. We dream something, we just let it pass by. <laughs> but for these people, they believe they knew there was an interpretation. There's a meaning, something there. Verse, the latter part of verse 8, And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, I pray you. Very important statement that you want to mark down. Amen. One of the foundational verses on biblical hermeneutics. Biblical hermeneutics, what that means is basically the, how to interpret the Bible. That is one of my most favorite topics to teach on. I never taught that before because I'm still in the steps of learning it, believe it or not. 
even though I might have uh, and accumulate much knowledge, I'm still learning that as I read and study the Bible. But there's so much to teach. That's definitely an advanced lesson, an advanced lesson on that. So I'm going to give you a little tidbit of that according to Dr. Uckman. So Joseph, he says to the butler and the baker, hey, don't interpretations belong to God? Ain't he the one who's in charge and who can interpret for you? Hey, please tell me. That's the idea. I pray you. So, it's so important to understand, you hear the infamous argument whenever you give the Bible to unbelievers, they'll say, well, you can interpret what, however you want out of the verse. That's a common uh, accusation. They'll also say, you can't find the correct interpretation. But that's incorrect. The Bible shows that the interpretation belongs to God himself. God is the right interpreter. You're right. You can take the Bible. As a matter of fact, you can take any book or writing out there and interpret it however way you want. But let's be honest. There's no such thing as an abstract interpretation. There's bound to be a boundary line, all right? Everyone has common sense. For example, if you look at a stop sign, you can interpret that five million ways. But if you get pulled over by a cop, that ain't going to work when you tell your cop your interpretation. The cop ain't going to agree with you like some dumb agnostic or unbeliever. Only agnostics and scientists and PhDs are th that dumb. And they'll go, oh, that's an interesting interpretation. No, they'll think you're stupid. And then they'll, get, they'll give you a ticket if you uh, pass the stop sign. They don't care. Even if you're ignorant, then they're going to teach you. So the context of that police, see, of his understanding, the context of, that, context of the uh, rules of that society who set up the sign, it is up to that person that they have to study it for themselves, and they can't play ignorance or whine about, well, the interpretation can go five million ways. You're still guilty. You're going to get a ticket. What more so with God? God's the one who created the signs. He's the one that created the words. You have to follow his context on how he sets things up. And there's no excuse away, uh, around it. You can give five million excuses, but uh, your excuse of interpretations can go five million ways or I didn't know or playing ignorance won't work. You'll still get your ticket and that's an eternity. That's an eternal ticket that you don't want to risk. So it is up to you, your part, that you have to study the person who set up the rules, the signs. Same thing with law in court, all right? Lawyers even try to wiggle their way around and interpret the law. And, uh, you know, Hoven, try as he might, he thought that he knew the law and that he can go around the court. But Dr. Uckman and Bible believers have warned him, look, it don't matter. You don't have the final say-so of the rules of the law because it's not your interpretation or how smart you are with the interpretation. It's by the context of the judge, the jury, and the court. They're the ones who dictate and decide on the rules for you, and mostly it's the judge. See, that's why you have to understand God's the judge. He sets you the law right here. And no matter how smart you are with your interpretation, and you can wiggle your way around it, and you think you can outsmart God, it doesn't matter. The judge don't care what you say, and he'll pound the gavel on you. Right. It is up to you that you have to understand the judge's mindset, the context of the judge, and you can't uh, just play dumb and say, well, I don't know. No, you have to study. Amen. Amen. You're just being lazy. That's it. Yep. All right, so use that argument on them. But anyway... So that's the idea. Do not interpretations belong to God. So let's see what God says on how we can uh, understand the interpretation, understand his word. Deuteronomy 18.21, the first rule is you must be willing to face facts. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21. You must uh, be willing to face facts. If there's something in your heart that is not willing, hey, that sin, because of these sins that you've done, those things are wicked in the eyes of God. You got to repent. You got to stop doing those things. 
I don't care if you like it or not. If you're willing to face that fact, then you will believe in it. The number one reason why people will not agree with your interpretation of the Bible is very simple. They're not willing to face fact. They go more by feeling. Come on. They are willing to go more by how they feel rather than facing the facts for themselves because it offends their feeling. Verse 21, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? So notice right here that uh, there's the, the person deep down inside wants to know what God really says. All right? Wants to know the fact. It's in the heart right there. Okay, so in their heart of hearts, they want the fact. All right, Deuteronomy 29, Deuteronomy 29. The second thing is you got to fear God. Fear God. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. Because people have lost their fear of the Lord, that's the reason why they think they can play with the words, interpret it however way they want to. Think about it. Uh, why billions die and go to hell? Because there's so many religions. Why are there religions? None of these so-called fools who started or founded these cults, cults, yes, cults, I'll say that, all right? I'm not like Ravi Zacharias who shies. You've got to be careful of using the word and get, got caught for perversion. No, I'm not going to do that. All right? So cults that they are is the reason why they're so bold to start their religion like that is because they have no fear of God. They want power. They want to play God. That's important to understand. That's crucial to understand. That's why there's false pastors. Uh, why is that? They have no fear of God. So they don't make a big deal about what's truth or what's error in doctrine. They have no fear of God. They said it doesn't matter which one's which. That's why they can't, you can't find the right interpretation. Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. Now compare that with Psalm 25, Psalm 25. Verse 14. Psalm 25, 14. Why would God reveal you the secrets from his word? So that you can do them. See, not just, oh, that's interesting, and then you, and then, uh, you know something. No, so that you can do something about it. So people, they uh, don't do anything about it because they have no fear of God to begin with. They just want to know knowledge. That's it. All right, 25, 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that uh, fear him, and he will show them his covenant. See? So God reveals the secrets to those that fear him. Why? If you fear him so you can do these things. People who don't do things, this is important for you too. People think, uh, well, I'm a truther. I want to know the truth. But see, they don't do anything about it. That's why God allows them to not see Bible-believing truth. That's important to understand. So if you really want to be a truther and know all the truth, nothing but the truth, then you have to do something about it. You have to have the fear of God in you to do something about it. If you don't, then God won't show it to you. No matter how much truth you try to gather or know. All right. Uh, Isaiah 29. This is important for you people too, this lesson. That way you can grow in knowledge of the scripture. I don't care how smart you are. I keep telling you a million times from this teaching. Doesn't matter how smart you are. Do not interpretations belong to God. You can preach a great sermon. You can teach backwards and forwards. I mean, I could uh, draw endless charts and teach something crazy as well. But it does not matter. You have to get that through your thick heads and don't let pride get to you because Lucifer knows the Bible way more than you and I do. And his pride destroyed him. So you can't let pride get to you and you must realize the interpretation belongs to God himself at the end. Amen. So if you want to know that book, you really want to teach and preach and all that stuff really well, you got to follow what God's regulations and rules are to interpret that book. All right, Isaiah uh, 29, verse 12 through 13. 12 through 13. Believe what it says. 
You're called a Bible believer. Okay, so you got to believe what it exactly says. Isaiah 29, 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. See, you don't have to be learned. You don't have to be smart. Saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. <laughs> That's you and I, right? <laughs> Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as his people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Now, isn't this, uh, this is the best verse to use on any atheist, agnostic, or scholar who says, well, you, you'll never know the interpretation. You can only go by scholars. This is the exact verse you want to use on those guys. Amen. That's the exact verse you want to use on those guys. You have to believe what it says. Uh, but the pe notice verse 12 right here. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. Saying, read this, I pray thee. It's important that people believe what God says and read it and believe it. But no, they refuse to read it. They say, I am not learned. You can interpret it many different ways. The Greek and Hebrew behind it is this and that. No, read it. Read it as it says and believe what it says. Interpret it according to what it says. When you go by exactly word for word, just like you're going right now, isn't it? Word for word, Bible study, interpretation. Notice that when we're going through our Genesis study, it's not that hard. You can figure it out. I guarantee 99% uh, of you, as I went word for word, if you've been doing it, if you've been interpreting the verse yourself as I'm explaining every word for word, you're like, I already know, I already know, I already know. How many of you got PhDs? How many of you know Greek and Hebrew? Bunch of fools nowadays. Don't let that wor wicked world deceive you, okay? Don't get blinded by that. Any man, woman, and child can read that book understand that book Amen. if they are willing to read it as it says and it takes time and study okay uh, let's look at Isaiah 28 Isaiah 28 and then Luke 10 Isaiah 28 Good. and then we'll look at Luke 10 Isaiah 28 and Luke 10 Another rule is that you must uh, realize that your original state, you're a babe. You're not a smart person. You're not an intellectual. You're a babe. And God is only willing to give the wisdom to babes. Now, that's a problem is that there's a lot of prideful Bible believers who think they know it all. They don't realize their baby tendencies or where they came from as a babe. And because of that, the Lord blinded them. And some of these, okay, a few of my people know this. Some of them turn out to be completely psychotic wackos. And they are so smart, they can interpret the verse backward and forward, and they always want to challenge people to a debate. You see that, PBI, you see that online. You know what they are? A bunch of prideful wackos. A bunch of prideful wackos. Why? Because they forgot their baby state. They revealed their baby state anyway. Yeah. Their immaturity. And God will hid the, wis uh, the wisdom if you uh, refuse to recognize your baby state. And you think, no, I'm a doctorate. I'm a Pharisee, a Sadducee. I know that book, etc. Isaiah chapter 28, and then we'll read verse 9. The Bible says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the, uh, from the breast. Babes. All right, Luke chapter 10 and verse 21. The Bible reads right here. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Yeah. Be careful when you think you're wise and when you're prudent. 
When you get there, you're easily going to be hidden. Uh, God's wisdom will immediately be hidden from you. Now, I always got discouraged on my age and then the kind of reputation that I got. I thought many times if I was only older, and when I took over this church, I always thought about if only I'm older, then maybe people would understand what I'm saying. Maybe uh, they'll be able to follow me. Maybe I'll be able to lead them. I feel incompatible. But actually, the Lord showed me that there is an advantage that I should be thankful for. All this responsibility given to me at my age makes me fear God and always uh, uh, keep myself as a babe. If I was... 85, uh, if I was 65, teaching the way that I am, do you know how much I would think I would know everything because I experience everything? So that's one thing that the Lord taught me. So I, uh, maybe the Lord uh, gave me all this at my age so that uh, I can keep realizing my baby state with my baby face online. <laughs> so I can remember that, all right? All right, 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. So I say this to be very careful, especially when you get up in years. When you get up in years, you think you know it all. Be very careful. All right, don't ever forget who you uh, are and who, uh, where you came from. That's so important. Who you are and where you came from. It'll keep you humble. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. All right, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. The Bible says right here, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord, uh, am I reading it? Yeah, yeah, I'm reading it. Okay. Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, so they get the knowledge of the Lord. They escape the corruption. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse, uh, is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It's important to understand that once you get knowledge, see, listen, well, I want to know the truth. But God's like thinking, can I trust to give you the truth? Because once he gives you the truth, he says your end is worse than the beginning. Uh, think about it. Uh, some of the best arguments against Bible-believing Christianity are those who experience Bible-believing Christianity. Right. And they mess up in some kind of cultic doctrine yeah. or some kind of wrong belief yeah. or become agnostic atheist. And they already learned all the truth. Yep. And so they're able to argue more against that. That's why, uh, look, I, I'm not going to drop names, but I know who they are. And that's why it's so important that you have to be very careful of that. God won't then give you the truth. So uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll look at verse 20. The Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it's important to understand that there is no private interpreter. Why? Because 2 Peter 2, 20 through 21 gives an example of false teachers. It's false teachers the Bible is talking about. Those who claim they can interpret the Bible for you and who have the knowledge. But God says that the, their latter end is worse than the beginning. So it's important to understand when you compare that with 2 Peter chapter 1, God makes it very clear there's no private interpreter of it. No private interpreter. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 12. And then Daniel 2, 20. Daniel 2, 20. And 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 12. It's also important to understand that education or ability does not mean a deeper revelation, further revelation, advanced revelation, a prophetic revelation, future revelation. Education or ability does not mean greater revelation. It's important to understand that. I want to say this as a testimony. That way it can be helpful, okay? 
So there's no doubt that uh, when I uh, took education, higher ed, it helped me immensely. Uh, and then it gave me a lot more critical thinking, helped me with very quick research. That's the reason why I'm able to find art, some kind of weird articles that people won't find out there, rare ones, or uh, have a lot in a quick moment of time. And then I accumulated so much knowledge because I had to do reading, 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 reading so much. Uh, has that helped me to be what I am? Certainly, uh, it helped me a lot. Uh, but this is important to understand. This is the blindness of mankind. What's really sad, to be honest, I don't like putting uh, the higher ed that I came from when you see that online. But uh, why do I do that? People think that's because I'm showing off. No, because you would agree with me if you saw that. Yeah. Right. And some of you might admit when you first caught on to my videos, that's what caught your attention. Guilty. That's it. One of the first things. That's our human nature. Unconsciously we have that. You have to understand that. So you have to separate the two. If I uh, erase the higher ed and everything, I wonder how you would respond more. All right, we're, unconsciously we have that. You have to break that. You have to break that. Another thing is this. I'm one of the very rare cases because I regret that there were Bible believers who came to me and asked me about higher ed and I helped them. And then I thought that everybody would be like me, but they didn't turn out to be like me. You might say, why? Because once you get, listen, once you get into education and your ability grows, your correction of that book grows. And what happens is your correction of that book grows, your criticism against that book rather than your teachers, rather than higher ed grows, rather than your own ability grows, and then it becomes such a dangerous thing where you get out of church altogether. So now I don't really recommend it. I don't really recommend it. To be honest, this is my advice, is that um, uh, if it's possible that you can make a living without going to college, I prefer that way. I do not recommend anyone to go to college, period. Uh, nearly 99.9% 99 .9 of cases, even Bible believers who've done great sack, listen, all right, and I hope they're watching me too, is that Bible believers who did go to college and done great sacrifice and doing a great work for the Lord, you know that when you are raised in Christian homes, you are doing so well, but when you got into college, then you've done stuff that parents and your own church is like, how'd you end up like that? Because of that college environment. Yes, and I hope you're watching me. So I don't recommend that anymore, I regret to say. Now, uh... If you're able to go and you're able to keep your Christian walk together, but more importantly than that, you know that's God's will, okay? Not your decision. You know that's God's will? You have my full support, all right? And then I'll help you best as I can. But if we're going to go by natural tendencies, natural decisions every day in life, it's natural. You fall for this, then that. Why? Because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. It's more natural and more easy to follow this. I had to get hypercritical thinking every time I'm here. And then I had to, uh, it's not natural for me to get here. I had to crucify my flesh and pay attention and study and be very studious to get into here. Okay? You have to do that. You have to have strong faith in order uh, to stay here and not there. But uh, if you don't have strong faith because you got out of church one, two, three, because uh, I know the excuses, I'm too busy. I got exams, and I heard that, okay? And I'm not going to park it here. I'm done, okay? Daniel 2.20. Daniel 2.20. The Bible says, Daniel answered, uh, uh, verse 19, notice verse 19, then was the secret revealed, right? God's secret revealed to Daniel. But in verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Uh, so notice right here that it was revealed 
uh, at verse 12 to what? To us, those who receive the gospel for salvation. We're revealed God's secret that even the angels could not really understand. That's pretty amazing. And then in Daniel 2.20, Daniel was one of God's children that received the secret, the revelation. But Daniel, this is important to understand, he comes from a higher ed group. He was the elite of the elites in his uh, class. Because they were scientists and magicians, if you go to Daniel chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to pick the best of the best. So he was, uh, he was higher than Ivy League. But even he himself recognized that uh, revelation is not the same as education or ability. Daniel had to humble himself. He didn't use his science, his knowledge, to understand Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He said, blessed be God, it's God who reveals it. All right. Uh, when I get on education or scholars, I, I go on a rant, sorry. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. I don't want to park it there, all right? Let's go to Revelation 19 and verse 10. Uh, the seventh way to interpret the book is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, you can prophesy. You can prophesy. Prophesy means preaching from the Bible. It also means predicting the future. Either or. But the point is, if you have the, spirit, uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ in you, then you have it. Revelation 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, if you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, then you have the spirit to prophesy. Uh, if you're an unbeliever, you'll never get that. Uh, you can never interpret that book. You have to uh, be a safe person to really uh, interpret it right. I also like how it says testimony. If you have a good testimony as well, then you can interpret that book even better. Uh, there are, I want to pound some of these Bible believers, and I hope they're watching me. Okay, <laughs> they, they ruin their testimonies, and they act like smart know-it-alls uh, that they know that book, and then they challenge everyone to a debate, and they always like to debate, you know, especially online, because they're such losers, and that's their only thing that they can ever do. And they always like to get infatuated with that, and they ruin their testimony. And because of that, you wonder why the Bible is so blind to them that they teach such bonker doctrines that you never thought that they would teach. Why do I say that? Because I'm speaking to you people too, all right? Especially those of you who've been discipled by me, I want you to remember everything that I taught you today. Oh, this is advanced teaching. Some, some advanced teaching I'm giving to you. Don't think you know it all. Amen. All right? I even admitted, I told you, I admitted myself. I can't, I don't feel capable to teach biblical hermeneutics yet. I think that's advanced teaching. See, you don't know it all. All right? And if some of these stuff was new to you and you're like, wow, I never thought of it that way before, you're still baby level. And good, keep it that way. Remember that. Keep that in your mind, okay? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. My, uh, my burden and task is to make you the best of the best. I really believe in that. I believe in making this church the best of the best in everything that I do, okay? In teaching, preaching, subject, everything. Soul winning, uh, everything. But at the, if I'm going to make you the best of the best, I'm going to teach you the best of the best in humility as well. Amen. And I'm going to pound that through your head over and over again, nail it, all right? Give you my 99 thesis arguments like Martin Luther 99 times, get that whacked into your head so that when you, if you want to stay the best of the best, your humility will stay best of the best, okay? Amen. All right, don't go off like a typical uh, PBI student who knows it all, all right? I come from PBI, I know that. Please, don't end up like that, all right? I've seen where you can end up. You end up your life in a mess. All right, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and uh, verse 10 through 15. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, the Holy Spirit reveals to you. The Bible says in verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Uh, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not the words which man's wisdoms teacheth. Right? All right. 
but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It's so important that you, uh, the Holy Spirit, His words, all right, that you compare what He says with other things that He says. Amen. So God's words compared with God's words. Again, Scripture with Scripture. See, that, that's how you find the right interpretation. I mean, that's uh, common sense even uh, in uh, legal matters, even uh, when, you're uh, when you're arguing for a paper, is that you have to compare things with other statements. That way you can find the proper, uh, they argue context quite often. That's how you find the right interpretation. Don't give me this jazz, you can interpret it five million ways, stop, okay? Stop. You're just like that idiot who gets pulled over at a stop sign saying a cop, well, when I saw that one word, stop. I mean, it's a simple word, you might think, but it's so complicated, more complex than that. The Greek and the Hebrew and the original behind it, stop. Don't embarrass yourself. All right? Don't, don't be stupid, stupid. All right? All right. Go to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. I really pound hard on the... Uh, higher ed, you notice that, right? Because it's so instilled in our minds that it became part of our culture, our norm now. So you've all been brainwashed by this. Uh, this is a higher ed area, okay? So I want to break that out of your mindset. That's why I slam it very hard, okay? So I hope you understand that, all right? I don't act like a jerk, okay? Uh, when I talk to these people or witness to them, I'll only do it if I really have to, all right? Uh, when I'm teaching you the Word of God, trying to hammer it into your head, then I'm going to do that, okay? All right, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. The last interpretation uh, is so important. You've got to be a dispensationalist. That's why it's so important. You have to be a dispensationalist, rightly dividing the Word of truth, all right? If you don't do that, then you're going to come out some kind of loony bin who might get tased at the border and teaching that the Jews are the enemies of everything and that we're all going to go through the tribulation together posting a 100 uh, different comments and rants on videos of Gene Kim about we're not going through the tribulation. You'll be like one of those weirdos and wackos. All right, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want to know truth from God's word, word of truth, right? Then you're going to rightly divide it. So you have to be a dispensationalist, okay? All right, uh, now we go back. I hope you uh, learned a lot. But that's not uh, all the teachings on biblical hermeneutics, and that's not even my teaching on it. That's only Dr. Ruckman's take on it. So I hope that uh, you've learned a lot, but there's so much more to learn on this subject that I really want to teach if the Lord wills someday. Okay. <clears throat> but I sometimes also hesitate to teach it. The reason why I hesitate to teach it is I'm afraid of giving a secret weapon to people, a nuclear bomb to people that they're going to misuse. Come on. And what happens when you give a nuclear weapon to somebody? then uh, you end up like today's current state where everybody is so afraid and uh, you can get billions dead. All right, so. Genesis chapter 40 again, Genesis chapter 40. We're going to look at verse uh, 9. Okay, let me go over here now. Let me know if I'm cut off, okay? All right, all right. And the chief, uh, verse 9, and the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me. So the chief butler uh, tells his dream to Joseph. He says, when I, uh, inside my dream, uh, look, lo and behold, there's a vine that stood before me. So there's a vine right here. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded. So there's three branches here, and then they bud. Uh, when they bud, what comes out? And her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. So blossoms uh, came out, but uh, more so, uh, it was the clusters. So clusters is obviously referring to the grapes that's all grouped in or clustered together. Uh, continuing onwards, uh, the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. So out of this uh, clustering, all right, all this uh, came out ripe grapes. It uh, brought forth ripe 
grapes. Verse 11, And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So the butler said, I, Pharaoh's cup's in my hand, I took those grapes, and then I squeezed them, I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and then I gave the cup back to Pharaoh's hand so he can drink it. Now, uh, when you start teaching that in the Bible, it was common that people drank grape juice. Uh, when you say that wine is grape juice, they think that that's very weird. They think, no, that's so unusual. It's more common that it's alcohol or liquor. It's so weird that people would be drinking grape juice, especially if it's for a special occasion, a special event. Well, that's really stupid because verse 11, all right, is that, notice right here, Pharaoh, special person, and you squeeze the grapes right into the cup, all right, then you give it. If that ain't fresh grape juice, I don't know what that is, and you think that was weird at that time? Even in Egypt, they had that. How about that, right? So uh, when you talk about drinking wine is grape juice and they think, I think it's more common for liquor or alcohol, not grape juice. I mean, during a special event, it's so occasional that you drink liquor rather than grape juice. You know why? Because you're so brainwashed and you're so used to this kind of generation, this culture. For a special event, it's always liquor. It's always alcohol, all right? Not grape juice, obviously. That's a problem because we're, uh, we're in this culture, we're in this mindset, we're in this day and age. You don't know what it was like back then. But uh, grape juice was a real thing. Okay, so this is actually then common. You have to understand, it is common for them to drink grape juice. Wine is grape juice. Look at Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. Wine is not grape juice. Where'd you get that from? When I think about wine, that means alcohol. Yeah, because again, you're in this culture. You're in this uh, year, day, and age. You don't know what it was like back then. When they said wine, that referred to grape juice. Isaiah chapter 65, we'll read verse 8. Notice that the Bible says about the cluster, which is the grapes, right? Isaiah 65, 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine, right, is found in the what? Cluster. Wow, how about that? So that's why a lot of times the Bible will say new wine. What does new wine mean? See, it's new, it's fresh. Well, uh, wine does not mean uh, grape juice in the Bible. Then what does new wine mean? Why does the Bible put a distinguishing with old and new wine? You're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, all right? Now, uh, why I say that is because there's a lot of people online, too, who really justify alcohol. So that's why I'm really slamming on this, all right? And then this mindset and this generation is so engrafted in sin they want to drink, all right? So that's why I'm slamming this really hard. So people, uh, if you're going to be totally honest, let's forget truth here, okay? Let's forget truth. Let's pretend that what I'm saying is not true or false. Forget all that. Let's be very honest. Is your argument based because you want to stick to that drink? Yeah, that's the God honest truth. If that's the case, I don't care how convincing my argument is. You'll still post a million comments underneath any of my shorts over there. All right. Uh, here's another one. We're going to look at Matthew 26, 29. Matthew 26, 29. Notice right here that during the Lord's Supper, Jesus drank alcohol and he got drunk with his disciples. I look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. Now, uh, some people online who just heard me say that, they probably took that seriously. Yeah. All of you are laughing. That should be the right reaction. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. What did Jesus say at the Lord's Supper when he's drinking wine? Verse 29, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of what? Fruit of this fruit of the vine, juice, come on, what, what do you want me to call it, man? This fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Come on, man, that's grape juice. Go back. All right, go back. 
to Genesis chapter 40, and then we'll read verse 12. Genesis chapter 40, we'll read verse 12. Now notice what Joseph says to the butler. He's going to interpret the dream to, uh, to him. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. So Joseph says to the butler, here's the interpretation. The three branches right here are representing three days. What's going to happen? Three days. Verse 13, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. So Joseph says within the three-day timeline, Pharaoh is going to lift up your head. So lift up your head is the same meaning as uh, restore thee unto thy place. More specifically, he's going to restore your position. Now, when you look up lift up thine head or lift up your head throughout the Bible, that has the occasional reference as from the down or uh, from being in the down or in the gutter, but coming up. That's what it means, all right? So whenever you see that phrase, that's what it means. More specifically, how God's going to get him out of the gutter and put him on top, lift up thine head, is he's restored back to his original position as the chief butler. Continuing on, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. So you're going to deliver, you're going to give Pharaoh's cup to his hand just like back then when you were his butler. That's the idea. All right, verse 14, but think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness. So Joseph is pleading with the butler, uh, but when you go back to your position as a butler, uh, please remember me. Don't for, uh, think about me when it goes well with you. When things go well with you, think about me, what I told you about that dream. And please show kindness, uh, I pray thee, so please, that's what it means, unto me, show kindness to me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. So please mention me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. So when he says, out of this house right here, that's referring to the captain of the guard. Uh, verse 15, or the warden perhaps. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. Uh, Joseph says, for certainly how I ended up here, so he says, indeed, certainly, it's because I was stolen away. I was sold off as a slave from the land of the Hebrews, from Canaan. And here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So the reason why indeed is used in verse 15 is because Joseph is trying to give, set the language and the tone that uh, this is a sure thing. I'm not guilty. All right? I wasn't caught for stealing, burglary, uh, killing, murder, perversion, molestation, etc. I mean, uh, the, it's a sure thing that it's because I came from a bad situation, bad place. Uh, they sold me off as a slave. And here, so I'm explaining now every word here. So here in this uh, prison, I didn't do anything wrong that they should put me in the dungeon. So he is in the dungeon. Now, compare that with Psalm 105. Psalm 105. So apparently, Joseph, it may have been two things right here in this case. Two things right here from this scenario is that one, Joseph... Uh, he may have been uh, shackled while he was uh, talking to the butler and the baker. So he's still in chains while he's talking to them. Or secondly, he was in chains, but uh, because now he's, uh, the warden entrusted him with the position to watch over the prisoners, uh, it's a past tense. He was in chains before, but now he got out of it. So Psalm 105 says it this way, that he was shackled before. Psalm 105, verse 17. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. So he was uh, put in the stocks, his feet as well. So he was chained. All right, go back to Genesis 40. Genesis chapter 40. <clears throat> now look at verse 16. This is a great example. Listen, this is a great example of a fleshly person who notices that some person 
hear some word from the Lord that's very positive. And this fleshly person says, I want to hear the word from the Lord as well. So then you can imagine he's excited. Oh, then this can happen to me too. So then he, uh, verse 16. So the chief baker wants to hear the preaching of God's word all of a sudden. The chief baker is willing to know the truth because he's a truther. The chief baker is going to church finally after all these years because something positive for him. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, see, told you so. <laughs> see, the chief baker, that's self-explanatory. So I don't have to explain it. He said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, uh, notice, I also was in my dream. See that? Me too. I, I was in my dream. And behold, I had three white baskets on my head. See, he's getting excited because it's kind of similar, you know. So the baker said that in my, I was in my dream, and lo and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. Verse 17, and in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. So he's saying at the top basket. So it seems like that he was putting it on, the baskets on top of each other. That's sometimes common in different cultures, right? They'll have several baskets on top of their head. So he says uh, there was all sorts of Baked, uh, uh, baked meats. The idea is some really good meats that was cooked for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. So then the birds came down from heaven and then they ate the basket from off his head. All right, verse 18. Oh man, this is positive right here. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Uh, yet within three days shall... Pharaoh, lift up thy head. Now, notice that this sounds really great because it matches with verse 12 and 13. This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head. Oh, that sounds great, right? It makes a huge difference with two words in that book. Don't subtract words from God. Don't add to it makes a huge difference that changes the entire interpretation. That's right, right. And you wonder why Bible scholars and modern Bible version translators are so blind to interpret God's word. They play with the words. All right. All right, let me explain it right here. Uh, going back, going back. So it sounds positive, you know. For this uh, baker. Oh, man, what a great sermon. Amen. And they, one year out the other, wasn't paying attention, you know. <laughs> like 90% of people going to church today. So verse 18, he, Joseph answers. He says, here's the interpretation. Uh, three baskets are three days. And within three days, Pharaoh is going to, here's one meaning. It sounds like lift up thine head. So he's going to get you out of the gutter and put you up, right? You remember, that's what lift up thy head means. But it makes a huge difference when you say, when you add these three words, from off thee. That changed everything. So, uh, so I, mean, uh, I mean it in a different way. He's going to, what does that mean? Lift up your head from off of you. So I just gave an example like that. It's hanging, see? The next part, and shall hang thee on a tree. Ugh, how positive, man. Man, that's a great Joel Osteen sermon right there, you know. <laughs> Joel Osteen should preach a sermon on that one. Lift up thy head from off thee. That's the title of my message today. Yeah. He, should, he should have a title like that, you know. So that's self-explanatory. The next part of verse 19, and the bird shall eat thy flesh from off thee. So the baker's going to get hanged. And then the birds are going to come down and eat uh, the flesh from off the baker. And Dr. Upman mentions in his uh, Adler commentary right there, the baker says, whoa, well, you know, uh, that doesn't sound like the power of positive thinking to me, Joseph. That wasn't a good sermon. That really offended me. Yeah. Oh, couldn't you say it any better? But Joseph, he had to go by what God says. All right? No, no matter how negative it is. So which person are you, right? Which person are you? The majority of people are like the baker nowadays when they want to hear the message of God's word. 
All right. Uh, let's look at verse 20. Verse 20. And it came to pass the third day. So that's self-explanatory. It just so happened that the third day, here we go, which was Pharaoh's birthday. So Pharaoh uh, has a birthday that he made a feast unto all his servants. So at Pharaoh's uh, birthday, he wants to make a party, a big feast for all of his servants. Now, um, from what I see right here, I could be wrong, but uh, in the Bible, isn't it very interesting that when you see the first mention of a uh, birthday right here, that it's not a positive reference. It's connected to a pagan. Pagans are big into days. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I sure hate to ruin Mother's Day, but, uh, you know, you got to realize this is a completely Gentile thing. Yeah. It's nothing scriptural. Nothing scriptural, all right? Now, I'm not saying it, you know, if you say Happy Mother's Day, you know, you're evil and you're pagan. No, 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 don't do that, all right? Uh, like Paul said, you know, however you observe the days, use it for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So it's a wonderful thing to observe the time of mothers. But, uh, but you have to understand that the history of it, the days and events, uh, besides the Jewish days that is mentioned uh, in the book of uh, Moses, or the instructions to the uh, Jews, the children of Israel, from the law of Moses, that pretty much nearly every day is pagan. Nearly every day is pagan, uh, besides Thanksgiving maybe. But eat, including your own birthday, which is kind of a shock which is kind of, of a shock, but yeah, everybody got to realize that pretty much any, uh, any day or holiday is pretty much from Gentiles or pagan. So let's look at Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2. And the Bible points out right here that concerning about uh, the days and the holidays, it's, uh, let's see right here, where's that one? Is it, sorry, what was that, brother? No, I, I'm looking at, Gal it is Galatians, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Galatians. I'm trying to find that uh, verse, though. But Colossians work as well. Colossians also works. Oh, Galatians 3, excuse me, I found it. Galatians 3. It's Galatians chapter 3. Okay, so uh, uh, notice right here that the Bible uh, talks about, uh, oh man, I'm having a hard time finding that verse. It is right here, though, I am very certain it is four, maybe? Four, four. <laughs> four, nine through ten. I am so sorry. <laughs> All right. Four, uh, nine through ten. Chapter four, nine through ten. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereon to ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye, uh, so Paul recognizes what they were like back then as Gentiles. They had a tendency of, verse 10, ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. So that was their tendency. So we see an example from Genesis 40 that Pharaoh had a birthday, but what other pagan king can you think about or remember who had a pagan birthday? Herod. Yeah, Herod, that's right. And somebody's head was off from him as well. Yeah. All right. Oh, All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. So uh, nearly every mention of birthday would actually uh, be pagan, believe it or not. Would be a negative reference in your Bible. So if you want to use that as your excuse not to celebrate somebody's birthday and not buy them a gift, then be my guest, use that Bible verse, all right? I, s I still think your heart's not right with God, though. <laughs> all right. All right, let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 40. So it's important to understand when... Uh, it's a good point to make this out because there are people who make a big nitpicky deal, big nit nitpicky deal about holidays, then uh, when you tell them a, another extreme that they haven't thought about, then they start to reconsider. You know, like, oh, every symbol that I see out there is occultic, globalist. Why do you use that symbol, pastor? Isn't that occultic, globalist? And then I'll say, look at your iPhone, man. All those apps, those symbols. And trash your iPhone. Those are so many occultic symbols, it's not funny. Right. Why are you paying with your coins and cash? Yeah. Isn't that the Illuminati eye at the back there, which is? Yeah. 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 Maybe it's safer 
to put something in your right hand, right? So that you don't have some kind of a symbol showing, you know? Maybe that's preferable to buy stuff, right? See, uh, I even hear that wedding rings, believe it or not, that they're pagan as well, believe it or not. What are you going to do? Get rid of wedding rings? Let's see how your wife feels, you know, your husband feels. Let's see if that works. See, it's completely Lulu. So then when I say, okay, then if you want to cancel that day because it's pagan, then let's cancel birthdays. And they go, what? And I was like, yeah, in the Bible, it's pagan. You research, uh, you research Christmas, you research uh, uh, Easter, you research uh, even 4th of July, they're connecting that to Masonic paganism. You know, oh my goodness, I kind of taught that in history discipleship class, and like I told you, that's like a rabbit hole. You go in and out like a ping pong, all right? You can't find what's true and false because there's so many lies that Mason says that you can't tell which one's true or false that they had their hands on it, okay? So it's just so messed up. You go 4th of July, and then uh, there are people even trying to put Thanksgiving as some kind of pagan or some kind of uh, secular Gentile thing. When you go like that, the rabbit hole goes endless, all right? So just stop, just stop, all right? What is our conviction on that? Romans 14, let every man be fully persuaded in their mind how they observe the days for the glory of God. So if uh, in your heart you cannot observe the certain day because uh, it violates scripture, it violates your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ, then by all means don't observe the day. But don't let your conviction burden the brother and sister according to Romans 14. Now look, I can, uh, look, don't get upset at me. I can empathize with you. In our church, uh, I don't do Christmas. I don't do Easter, okay? Uh, Easter, uh, I'll call it Happy Resurrection Day. Christmas, I hardly put anything. I don't believe in Christmas trees or anything like that, all right? So because I'm responsible for my church, how I live my life, I have to apply that to the church. But uh, when I go to your homes, you know, I don't get on you and saying, brother, <laughs> I see that little Christmas tree over there on the corner there. Yeah, you gotta. <laughs> if you don't trash that, you're not invited to our church. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go to Genesis chapter. F oh, I'm out of time. All right, I stop right here. Okay, I stop right here. Okay, we ended here, and then we'll continue on. Um, I did not go through the typology of Christ and Joseph, so we will cover that uh, at our next chance to study. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth of your book. Dismiss us now with your blessing and help us to keep growing in, in knowledge of the scriptures, eating and feeding and living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.